in real life. Okay. Good evening, friends, and welcome to this 23rd episode of All India Postgraduate Teaching Program, which was a new initiative initiated by ARCOS in this season. This is a PG program with a difference because we cover the uncovered aspects of teaching program like case presentation, journal clubs, OSCEs, and didactics on topics which are not necessarily comprehensively available in a textbooks. We had a last episode of journal club where we had an attendance. I mean, in fact, the viewership had been close to 2,500 in the last seven days. So here we present our 23rd episode of the series, which is a didactic lecture on surface modification of IOLs, which was asked as a long question in one of the DNB finals. Today, didactic lecture would be presented by Dr. K K Kiran Kumar, who is an associate professor, Corny and Cataract and Refractive Sur uh, Services at Minto Regional Institute of Ophthalmology, Bangalore. He's a dear friend of mine, of course. My special thanks goes to Dr. Suvira Jain, who is a clinical head of cataract and cornea and phaco development at KBH Bachuali Eye Hospital, Mumbai. Dr. Mona Deshmukh, who is a senior consultant at, at Meenakshi Eye Care Center and also a, one of the ex faculties of Government Medical College, Nagpur. She is still actively involved in teaching the DNBs of our hospital as well as Mahatma Eye Institute. I welcome you all and also Dr. Nivedita Narayan, who is a senior cornea consultant, Sankaran Netrale Chennai. I'm really thankful to all the three people for having consented to be a discussant on this particular topic. Now, without much ado, can I request Dr. Kiran Kumar to share his screen and uh, initiate the proceedings? Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes, Dr. Kiran. Yeah. Mm. Sir, uh, in this occasion, I would like to thank AOS and ASC Chair and my dear friend, Dr. Prashant, sir, for giving me this opportunity to present on this uh, huge platform. And uh, the topic of uh, discussion is surface modification of IOL. And I think uh, everybody presumes this to be a dry topic and uh, as far as i know this is the only platform this topic has been discussed in indian ophthalmology till now so i'll try to make this as an uh, interesting session as far as possible and uh, let's uh, go to my talk so as we all know like uh, the cataract surgery is the most common surgery which we perform in our uh, daily routine and uh, as eye surgeon, I think we should know each and every aspect of IOL uh, before we implant into patient's eye. And it's also our responsibility to, uh, to give the most updated and the best IOL to the patient needs. So the main goal of a cataract surgery is to improve quality of vision for life. So eye quality vision is more than something uh, 2020, wherein patients should be able to read uh, like proper uncorrected distance visual acuity of uh, six by six and good near visual acuity and actually uh, the continuous range of vision with good clarity and good contrast even in all, all lighting conditions. So before going in detail into my topic, I'd like to tell you a few things about the optical properties which really decides our uh, uh, the visual acuity gain post-operatively. One such factor is spherical abrasion which occurs when all uh, incoming light rays end up focusing on different points. So what happens? So definitely even if patient has 20-20, uh, our uh, corneal has a positive spherical abrasion of about uh, plus 0.27, but this will be neutralized by our crystalline lens. But when we replace this crystalline lens by an uh, uh, intraocular IOL, this spherical abrasion acts to be neutralized by an IOL. Otherwise, there will be less clarity and making it hard to obtain sharp images. But whenever we introduce an IOL, definitely this spherical abrasion has to be balanced to get a clear uh, uh, sharp image like this. And one of the most important other factor is like chromatic abrasion, which occurs when wavelengths of light are focused at different position. What is it actually? So the, the IOLs with uh, more chromatic abrasion makes uh, blurred or noticeable colored edges can appear around the objects. 
So this is decided by something called dispersion of property of an IOL, which is indicated by something called Abbe number, which ranges from about 37 to 55. But when you go for this mathematical number, the IOL which highest Abbe number will have least chromatic abrasion, and that is very best for our eye to accept when it to clarify vision. Mm. So to summarize these two slides, we should need an IOL which has uh, essentially zero spherical abrasion at the end of surgery and low induction of chromatic abrasion due to its material and definitely it should cause less PC or capsular phimosis and all this together will lead to high quality of vision for life. So we need an ideal IOL. The history of IOL started in 1952 where uh, Harold uh, uh, Ridley noticed uh, the pilots in World War II because of uh, aircraft cockpits, uh, the acrylic plastic got lodged into their eyes and it, it, it did not incite as much inflammation as expected. So he started researching on this and implanted his first uh, uh, the acrylic plastic IOL in about 1952 and it is almost like seven decades now, still the search on ideal IOL is going on. So despite advanced surgical techniques, equipments, good surgical results, complications of cataract surgery still occur which can affect final visual outcome. The most common thing pertaining to our topic is like posterior capsular opacity, which is usually seen irrespective of the IOL or irrespective of the surgery in about 20 to 50 percent of the cases. And cystoid macular edema and one of the dreadful complications is end of thalamitis. As you know, cataract surgery releases leukotrienes on posterior glandins by anterior uvea, which increases the retinal vascular permeability, resulting in CME in most of the cases. It's about like 1 to 1.7 as per literature. So the need for the surface modification IOL arises to address these challenges. As well as there are so many like treatment options to treat these complications. But uh, as, far, as far as we know, like prevention is always the best cure and search for an ideal biocompatible IOL is a first measure towards this prevention. So what is this biocompatibility pertaining to IOL? We have two main components in uh, cataract surgery. That's EVL biocompatibility and capsular biocompatibility. Let's discuss few slides about this. EVL biocompatibility is nothing but reaction of the iris, cilia body, and anterior cord to the IOL. When we do intraocular surgery, there will be intrafluidics which stimulates uh, iris tissue, thereby uh, releasing the inflammatory mediators or leakage of proteins and macrophages which adhere to the IOL surface and promotes inflammatory response. This results in EVL uh, uncomfortability, if at all, if it doesn't uh, go with the demand. And there is also chances like incomplete polymerization of the primary optic material or extrinsic contamination of optic, which may lead to the potential toxic reaction. This was one of the major cause of recent pandemic of uh, TAS, which was noted in the entire India. And uh, there are some cases where due to complication, we will place a single piece IOL in the sulcus, which results in continuous shafting of IOL due to the continuous contact with the iris and ciliary body. And all this leads to the increased anterior chamber reaction, thereby reducing the better outcomes post cataract surgery. And the most important other factor is capsular compatibility. Like whenever uh, we introduce an uh, allogenic material that's an IOL into the capsule which might be friendly to the lens epithelial cells thereby it allows it to proliferate so it grows over the IOL and it causes IOL opacification mm -hmm. and calcification or it might inhibit the growth of uh, lens epithelial cells but it allows it to transform into mesenchymal cells thereby causing fibrosis resulting in capsular fibrosis. So an ideal IOL should be combination or a hybrid between these two characteristics to give the better clarity post-operatively on long-term basis. So factors determining biocompatibility, it's not only like IOL material, there are other factors like when we operate uh, in an pediatric patients, definitely there is an 100% chances of uh, PCO formation in less than three years. And there are other things like surgeon factors also. An ideal capsular excess size should be at least one millimeter smaller than the average optic diameter, which is around six millimeter. So we usually prefer op uh, capsular excess size of five millimeter to prevent PCO. And surgical approach, literature says like femtosecond is associated with less tissue damage, thereby less inflammation or less stimulation of UVL tissue. And most important thing is IOL factor. This includes design and materials. 
So before going in detail, let us know like what are all the IOL materials in an average locker in briefly to tell about this IOL materials. There are three main components. One is acrylic, silicon and PMMA. Acrylic has something called hydrophobic and hydrophilic. We just put a drop of water and an IOL. It depends on the, uh, the angle which with, uh, it forms with the IOL decides whether it's an hydrophobic or hydrophilic surface. So why is it really important? That we will know in our next slides. So this is a type of the IOL material. PMMA, as we all know, historically used material. And even now it is extensively used in most of the centers. But the only thing it is rigid so that we need a larger incision of about uh, 5 to 6 millimeter. And hydrophobic acrylic. Hydrophobic is one of the best material which causes less AC reaction. But it, it causes more AC reaction. Sorry. But it causes less PCO. The least PCO is associated by hydrophobic IOL. What about this hydrophilic, which is same in flexibility for user incision like hydrophobic, but it is very UVL friendly so that it causes least AC reaction, but it is associated with more incidence of PCO. So the other IOL is like a silicon. This has a very low refractive index. So thickness is very high. So we need incision of usually more than 3.2 millimeter in such cases. And it is also not suitable for many cases like in diabetics where uh, they might undergo like uh, the future vitrectomy with silicon oil insertion where they, it increases the chances of incompatibility in such cases. And colamer, this is a very a, a well uh, deserved IOL, which is excellent for premium IOLs and also the acrylate and methyl acrylate copolymers which has wide range of refractive indices and it can be used in um, customizable for patients as well. Whether an IOL material is biocompatible or not also depends on clinical scenario. As I told you, hydrophobic has least PCO, but when you want to introduce it to an uatic patients, it also causes increased incidence of uatics. So in such cases, we will titrate between whether we need more PCO or less reaction. So hydrophilic IL is usually recommended for uatic patients. In a similar way, silicon oil, as I already told you, it may not be an alternate for eye myopes with increased risk of retinal surgery and also in diabetic patients. So the one line which I which uh, we should know is like no single type of IL is suitable for all cases. So in this uh, background, we want to find out like what is an ideal IOL. As we all know, like uh, an IOL should cause least inflammation. It should not cause too much of PCO, and it should not be a source of infection as well. So infection, it gains entry into high uh, through a IOL material and also it forms a biofilm so that it causes acute or late onset end of thalvatase. And recent advances are more into the carrying mode monitor se sensors, which acts as a biosensing devices to measure certain parameters in the body indirectly through an intraocular lens material. And there are certain new IOL materials like injectable IOL, shape memory and adjustable IOL. Adjustable IOL is based on the property of UV polymerization uh, when we see like when if at all if there is chances of uh, uh, like IOL suppressing post-operative period by exposing to UV rays, a correction up to two adapters can be done through this adjustable IOLs. So why surface modification of IOL is needed? This is just a summary definitely to biocompatible, to minimize inflammation and foreign body responses, thereby to reduce postural capsular opacification. And glistening is one of the other factor which really decides long-term prognosis of any intraocular lenses, which are fluid-filled macro holes that affect optical clarity that needs to be reduced. And definitely optical clarity, which enhances transparency, reducing the incidence of visual disturbances, such as allo and glare. This is like very prerequisite when we are planning for premium IOLs. And also there is something about reduced post-operative infections. So there is research going on on uh, impregnation of uh, uh, antibiotic materials onto the surface of IOL to prevent infections and minimize the cellular additions just to prevent cell migration and fibrosis so that to reduce the incidence of PCO and all these uh, things which we are doing only for one thing is patient satisfaction with better visual acuity, comfort and safety.
So techniques of surface modification, there are so many techniques which are given in the literature, like surface coating technique, there are a few materials which we coat on the IOL surface and uh, the, the, the things which can be grafted on, uh, grafted on the IOL surface which reduces PCO and plasma surface and photochemical reaction to reduce uh, like glare and other things, ultraviolet radiations and surface like surface initiated reversible addition fragmentation chain transfer. This is more of technical terms. So it, when we convert into applied aspects, it's mainly the plasma treatment. It's nothing but plasma deposition can alter the surface chemistry, making it more hydrophobic or hydrophilic. And even coating technology is like applying thin films or coatings like hydrophobic or anti-reflective coatings can enhance optical property and biocompatibility. And grafting can also be done. Functional groups can be grafted on the IOL surface, which modifies its chemical properties. And most important thing is antibacterial modification, which incorporating antibacterial agents on the surface can reduce infection. So co some common surface modification which is done is like the most important clinically for this for, for us is like hydrophobic and hydrophilic, which can reduce post-operative complications and improve clarity of vision and anti-reflective coating. The most common complaint of any premium IOL patient is like glare and reflections. So which needs to be like uh, done by anti-reflective coatings. And there is something called blue filter, which needs to be done to protect retina and reduce the age-related macular degeneration changes in elderly patients. And UV blocking coatings to protect eye from UV radiation. And there is something called scratch resistant coating, which can also be done, which basically, yeah, protect the IOL surface from damage during implantation. These modifications aim to enhance overall safety and performance of the IOL. So there are, there are two things now. We need, uh, we need surface modification which reduces inflammation. The other thing is like which has to reduce PCO and other extra addition uh, uh, things which might uh, give a UV protection or anti-glare or anti-glistening. So these are the things which needs to be done. What are the materials which can be used to reduce inflammation? The most common thing in the literature is apparent surface modified IOL. Or other things like MPC, PEG, N-vinyl, pyrrolidone, and iridine coated IOL can also be done. The, what is important for us is mainly the repairing coated IOL. It's, it is one of the like most appreciated IOL in uh, uatic patients, which can be used on uh, any material, especially in PMMA and silicon IOLs. Useful in patients with preoperative UATs, which prevents adherence of proteins and macrophages. But the only thing is it increase the, increases the chance of uh, postural capsular opacity that needs to be tightened. So we need uh, something like MPC. What the, what this is the latest technique. Suppose this is an IOL. In a, it, it, it causes hydrophilic surface of the anterior clip. And whereas posteriorly, it will have hydrophobic and also, uh, so thereby it reduces uh, anterior chamber reaction by hydrophilic anterior surface and it reduces PCO by hydrophobic posterior surface. But uh, for seeing only this is uh, uh, like um, very difficult and it takes longer time to produce, produce and it, it, it has a lot of cost in production and this IOL is yet to come in the market. And the second thing is capsular biocompatibility. PCO is caused, as we all know, the migration and growth of uh, lens epithelial cells in the posterior capsule. Mm. The incidence of PCO is an important manifestation of capsular biocompatibility. So IOL materials till now have been mainly focusing on inhibiting lens epithelial cells are migrating or killing lens epithelial cells. So what are the changes which we can do? There are some materials which can be impregnated onto the high oil so that it reduces this lens epithelial cell proliferation and migrations. And most common is this doxorubicin and methotrexate. And there are some other chemical reaction and uh, photodynamic therapeutic effect and also by hydrophobic and hydrophilic modifications. So uh, it's not only by chemicals, there are some modification which can be done in design as well. As you all know, the hedge of the optic is, is usually smooth. Thereby, it allows the migration of epithelial cells on either side, causing postural capsular opacity or contraction or phimosis. So they just made a design of square or the hedges, uh, which has a firm, uh, firm attachment to the postural capsule, but at the same time, anterior hedge used to cause something called hedge glare, which will be very disturbing for the patient. So later on, they modified something called smooth anterior hedge, 
followed by sharp posterior edge thereby it totally eliminated edge glare effect and also it prevented posterior capsular migration of lens epithelial cells thereby it acts as a barrier against cell movement to the posterior capsule and also we can just create an optical barrier therein wherein we separate anterior and posterior uh, lens surface just by a sharp ridge but uh, it also causes some optical phenomena which will be very disturbing for the patients and polishing techniques this is a very good employing advancing polishing advanced polishing methods to create smooth and optical clear oil surface reduces the likelihood of cell addition proliferation thereby minimizing the pco risk so some of the like PCO prevention surface modifications are like, as I told you, it's all about like coating technologies with anti-adhesive properties to discourage cell attachment. It may involve hydrophobic or hydrophilic coatings. And drug eluting coatings, as I already told you, drug eluting agents like doxorubicin and methotrexate can be impregnated onto the IOL surface, which prevents proliferation and migration of the lens epithelial cells, thereby reduces PCO. And the best surface to prevent PCO is hydrophobic surface modification. And anti-inflammatory surface incorporation materials or coatings with anti-inflammatory properties which aims to reduce inflammatory response, which is associated with increased PCO risk. And so, there is something called nano structuring, wherein an IOL surface is modified in a nano textured way, similar to this, thereby it totally eliminates migration of the epithelial cells along the ridges, therein the risk of PCO is completely eliminated. And the most third important thing is whenever we put an extraocular or intraocular lens, it should be free from the source of uh, intraocular infection. That's end of dermatitis, which is one of the mm -hmm. dreadful complication. Definitely, IOL should not be a source of infection. So some of the drugs like moxiflox, norfloxin, ofloxin have been like uh, along with the carrier coated on IOL surface by copolymerization and which releases drug up to 21 days. This is all into research, uh, the, thereby it totally eliminates the use of post-operative antibiotics. And the most uh, important thing is UV light protection. A normal crystalline lens absorbs UV rays, as we all know. But when we replace it with a pseudophagic IOL, we need chromophores like benzotriazole or benzophenol, which absorbs these you know, UV rays, thereby decreases the risk of macular degeneration in patients. And they're covalently bonded to IOL material, which are usually acrylic hydrophobic IOLs. And ultraviolet protection, uh, yellow oils are very famous, as you all know, the axis of IQ is one such IOL. And there's something called medium IOL, which is called smart IOLs, very hydrophobic acrylic photochromic lens with UV absorption in dim light and UV and blue light absorption in bright light. Blue blocking oil, it is very important to protect RP from uh, blue light induced damage. And the, the latest uh, technology or uh, the future advances in IOL is like uh, biosensing technology, which makes the IOL to consider as a biosensing molecules are impregnated into the IOL. There were some of the like uh, biosensing markers like uh, MMP9, uh, uh, glucose parameters and uh, fluctuations in IOP can be made out just by implanting these biosensing uh, devices along with IOL into the bag. And uh, with this background, so there are so many IOLs and so many companies and every company comes to us and they promote uh, their IOLs to be the best in the market. Uh, let us uh, know actual uh, truth or I would like to throw some light on available IOLs so that it will be a key for all practitioners and even young ophthalmologists to consider IOL depending on the clinical requirements or uh, patient requirements. Uh, I, I, I'll discuss both uh, imported and as well as uh, the most commonly used uh, Indian IOL, that is Apas, Fermi, Algon, J&J, and uh, there's no financial uh, interest. Let me see that most of the available IOLs in the market are all, are all hydrophobic. But only the Zeiss IOL, which is there in the market, which has hydrophilic core with hydrophobic sub surface. And the other property we need is a spherical aberration. Uh, we all know, as I told you, there is a corneal aberration of plus 0.27, which needs to be neutralized by the IOL which are going to implant it. Only the J and J Technis IOL has exact minus 0.27 of spherical aberration, which completely makes an IOL um, uh, 
spherical uh, is spherical abrasion neutral so that it will have a top notch image clarity but uh, but in uh, the io like mm -hmm. algon which has a spherical abrasion of minus 0.17 still there is some amount of spherical positive spherical abrasion on the, uh, co the cornea which affects clarity of the vision on long term especially in night driving and the yellow tint is there in almost all iol uh, as well know it has to protect us from uv rays and also blue tints is an, another addition and square edge which is there in almost all but as a result of this not all patients, uh, not all patients will have edge glare. Only few patients, wherein rexis margin is very big, they are exposed to this edge glare effect. And contrast sensitivity is also equally good. So at the end of this, uh, uh, especially this particular slide, most of the IOL have similar properties. It's only by financial disclosures you now we can uh, decide which IOL to use on which patient. So with this uh, uh, background, I am almost uh, to the end of this talk. I I I, I didn't want to uh, like uh, take it uh, for a longer session, like thirty or forty five minutes, since uh, it was more of uh, theory and uh, surface modification of IOL improves biocompatibility and quality of vision. And as we all know, like IOLs have gone through a transition from rigid materials to foldable soft materials, and the focus today is to give patient an IOL which is as close to possible as natural crystal lens and the research is still going on. So at the end of this talk, if I want to propose for an IOL, I love an IOL which is very specific irrespective of whether it's an Indian or uh, imported, which should have an hydrophilic anterior surface which reduces your anterior chamber reaction. And I need an hydrophobic posterior surface which totally eliminates posterior capsular opacity. And I need a smooth anterior edge followed by a sharp posterior edge, thereby it totally eliminates PCO with a biosensing molecule impregnated or collaborated with this IOL will be my visionary IOL uh, for the future. Uh, thank you. Great job, uh, Dr. Kiran Kumar. You really did that justice to this particular topic. <laughs> Whatever best as a posterior segment surgeon, I could understand. I really understood a lot about the designs and compatibility yes, things which are happening in your field. Yes. Uh, so now I invite the discussants that is going to be Dr. Nivedita, Dr. Mona and Dr. Subira ma'am to carry forward the discussion so that you can elaborate on certain points which you feel would be important for the postgraduates to understand and write as well as help them in their small why I will selections and all. Please. Excellent talk. Am I yeah. audible? I think uh, Dr. Uh, Kiran has covered uh, the topic extensively, leaving uh, no room for <laughs> any... You can answer the uh, discussion, but still we will attempt. It's an excellent talk, widely covering the topic from surface modification to the edge, to the spherical aberration and whatnot. Kiran, so, can you unshare your screen? Yeah, thank you. So uh, just a little point. I was very keenly looking for some points which he would miss, but unfortunately he did not. But still, I would just add Lysozyme modified uh, surface modified IOLs are there specifically for uh, endophthalmitis prevention. UV ozone treatment of surface IOL, these are specifics. That's why I just thought I will highlight it for PCO pre prevention. Heparin, you have extensively spoken about it. Then the other one is you told about the antibiotic loaded lenses uh, with uh, zwitter ionic capacity, which has plus and the negative poles specifically to avoid the endophthalmitis. These are the things I thought I will add in the surface coating. And uh, about the spherical aberration, yes, it is just a surface modification where you produce an aspherecity to match the natural lens, beautifully explained by you, in order to replace the function of the natural lens when you knock it off to compensate for the positive corneal spherical aberration. Excellent thing. Earlier stages, when we were uh, implanting this, there was a hype about how it is important to uh, negate the corneal or compensate the corneal aspherecity. Over a period of years, we have realized some amount of spherical aberration left behind gives some depth, depth of perception. So now the concept is not to correct it fully. And in the recent IOLs, if you see, 
the surface modification is in such a way that the central has neutral and the paracentral has some and in the periphery it is different. So there is a variable surface modification. So this also the PG should know if they want to ask about the latest thing, then you have a variable surface asphericity to match for why this is important is to match for all pupil sizes in mesopic, um, scotopic and in the uh, bright light situations, this kind of a variable asphericity is important. I think that is what I wanted to add. I think, ma'am, can you highlight on the lysozyme part and all uh, for the sake of postgraduates, what exactly advantages it would offer and other things? You just mentioned it, but if you can... Yeah, these yeah, these uh, coated lenses will prevent the formation of uh, inflammatory and so the related endophthalmitis. So it is basically oriented towards reduction of endophthalmitis. So basically what happens is whenever an organism gain entry into an IOL, no, it's to the IOL surface. Once it goes into the IOL, it forms something called biofilm formation. So which will be very difficult for us to treat by topical antibiotics. So when we introduce this lysosome impregnated IOL, this prevents the biofilm formation of any organism and the IOL so that it totally eliminates the risk of uh, endophthalmitis associated with IOL. Dr. Sorry. Mona, Dr. Sovira, please. Dr. Sorry. Sovira. Ma'am ma just spoke about the surface modification, how the spherical aberrations are uh, altered. So the newer IOLs, I'm sure that that's also interesting for the students. Uh, as we speak, somewhere in the world is developing newer IOLs. So they're, they're always constantly on the move. And now with, uh, with the need to correct for near, there are so many different options that it's important that we match the patient preferences and psychology to the area of files which are available. But in surface modification of spherical aberrations, as ma'am has rightly said, that leaving behind some surface, some spherical aberration gives you an ex ex excessive depth. So there are these EDOF lenses which are uh, wavefront modified or spherical aberration modified. So those are the true EDOF lenses which actually work with, and the, 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 the mixed ones, the true EDOF lenses are those which are like the mini well. They would need to know the newer lenses also available in the market, I think. And they need to know that the EDOF lenses, the extended depth of focus lenses, do not have rings on them because the rings cause photic phenomena. But everybody wants to be able to see slightly more for near. So the surface is modified with the posterior spherical aberration in the middle one third, a negative in the intermediate zone, and uh, and a plano in the periphery. And all of this causes a stretching of the focus, elongation of the focal point, therefore giving people patients some amount of good intermediate vision. So that's the surface modification of the spherical aberrations in some lenses. And they are the most recent in the market today. So how would you decide which particular lens, ma'am, you spoke about? Uh, how how does a postgraduate, if he has a patient walk in, how would he decide which particular ones he should use for his patient? Well, I think it's very important that, uh, I mean, it's getting a little clinical though, but it's very important that the patient's have to be understood as to what are their lifestyles, what are their preferences, what are their hobbies, what is their personality type, you know, and what is their ambient lighting condition, what is their reading distance, the length of the arm, all those things. And most importantly, what does the patient want? If the patient comes to you for some amount of spectacle independence, then uh, they will be willing to compromise distance, but they will not be happy if they can't look at their smartphones. So my decision would be based on what the patient really wants. And if what I give him is not going to, you know, disrupt or cause further, like if someone working in a post-production dim room, I would not give him a multifocal lens because there's always a drop in contrast, which is measured by measuring the MTF on the on ray tracing aperometry. So I guess that's that's how it, I would choose a lens for a patient. Before I move on to Dr. Mona, uh, Dr. Kiran. What are the available surface options right now, surface modifications which are available in today's practice for the postgraduates to know? And in which clinical setting would you recommend? If, yes, this particular thing is available, you should use for this. Can you be uh, more elaborate on that particular yeah. point? Yes, sir. So basically, see, uh, to sum up uh, that entire PPT or discussion for any uh, postgraduate, um, hello. Uh, we can hear you. 
So a one zero zero. Uh, so to, to sum up the entire uh, like uh, PPT, uh, there are few things which needs to consider. The PCO, the amount of PCO which an IOL is going to cause. And uh, there's something called anterior anti-inflammatory function which needs to have in, with every IOL. And the amount of end of the is, it might lead to, even though incidence is very less, about 0.1 to 0.2%. And also the carrying uh, monitor sensors, which is very far. The main consideration for us is like PCO. As you all know, the, 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 the IOLs which has hydrophobic surface uh, will be having the least PCO. And that is one of the like most common complication which we see in our daily day-to-day -day, uh, patients. And also the second thing is like uh, post-surgery post inflammation in the anterior chamber, okay, which can be controlled by an hydrophilic IOL. So whenever a patient of U8 is comes to you, you have to go for an hydrophilic IOL instead of an hydrophobic IOL. And uh, definitely, uh, like uh, it, it, it uh, depends on the requirement of the patient as well, whether you need uh, like a only distance visual acuity. My choice is always a monofocal IOL for all patients, irrespective of the patient needs. Like whenever uh, I, in my practice, I never counsel any patients for uh, you know, the premium IOL to the maximum extent, unless it is asked by themselves. So depending on their requirements, we decide like what IOL can be implanted. Like Mam Ma said, Suvira Mam Ma said, whether uh, he needs more of new vision. So definitely, uh, as I told you, the complete IOL is yet to emerge or is yet to be invented or discovered. All properties cannot be implanted with one single IOL. We have to compromise something or other feature depending on the patient priority. So a patient who is working more under sun, definitely I'll propose him a UV protective coated lenses. And uh, suppose uh, an housewife, a typical housewife not having much of distance activity, I'll just uh, uh, give her like uh, something like panoptics that, that works very well. Uh, the classic example is my mom only. Uh, we just uh, give a bilateral panoptic. She is doing extremely well. She has never complained any glare or lab. At the same time, uh, if you implant for a patient who is having too much of driving or night driving, they'll definitely have more of glare. So we need to titrate depending on the patient requirement and acceptance and always give the real, realistic expectation to the patient and disclose him each and every fact. And definitely he will be in a position to choose his own IOL. Dr. Mona Deshmukh, yeah, can you just uh, have your point, please? Dr. Suvira, ma'am, and... Uh, ma'am and can you be louder Kumar. yes uh, dr kiran kumar has already given a almost a vast view of this topic but i will restrict my uh, suggestion to the postgraduates because when we examine the paper uh, what we observe is once suppose there's a odd topic, dr mona can you be a bit louder a bit louder close is it okay yeah please louder yeah what I would tell the postgraduate is if such an odd question comes, what they usually do is they tend to sway on the side what they know. Like they will give the classification of different IOLs and the diffractive and the refractive and the ADOFs and the other things. But if you restrict your writing to the specific question which is asked, like this was a very odd topic, but still if such topic comes, the first thing which sir has already told that the biocompatibility which was very important to be mentioned here and the need for surface modification why do you need this surface modification when we have already come from an era of pmma to the acrylic the hydrophilic the hydrophobics and the silicones and the newer adopts and the other uh, structurally different uh, modified IOLs which are there. So as far as the postgraduates uh, presentation in writing is concerned during their theory papers, please be specific regarding the uh, small uh, introductory line of one or two sentences followed by the need for this surface modification and the biocompatibility which is very important as already told the UVL biocompatibility and the capsular biocompatibility, the different techniques. Why do you require this uh, biocompatibility as uh, is already discussed and the different techniques, the surface coating which are there, the plasma treatment, the coatings with the antibacterial, other modifications and the antibiotics which sir has already described. 
and uh, basically if you have the uv blocking and the blue filtering or the blue filter coating lenses and the other um, different types of modifications which are there the hyperin surface modification which is the most important thing most of the students have only focused on this part because they usually know that the hsm or the PMMA initially, which we used to use even in camps and it is used in small incision cataract surgery, the polymerization of this methyl methacrylate has changed the surface properties of these hydrophobic to hydrophilic, which resulted in reducing the inflammatory process and uh, better uveal biocompatibility. So uh, this was important. I think one was the fluoride hydrophobic molecule, IOL, which is nowadays uh, treated for being having a higher contact angle and uh, this heparin coated usually converts to the hydrophilic uh, material and basically used again in cases of uh, uveitis benefits we all know of heparin surface modification that it reduces the post operative inflammation less cellular response and appears almost um, the only thing which is uh, important is we know that there is a significant pco Associated bacterial endophthalmitis, which we have taken into account is because of the adherence of the bacteria to the implanted IOL, which sir has already told that there is a formation of a biofilm. Yes, and release of leukotrienes, prostaglandins, which stimulated by the IOL can cause CME is another important factor, which needs to be taken into account when these points are written in the exam. As far as the biocompatibility is concerned, the other part, which is the modification of the IOL, is the design modification. Now, um, as the surface modification, as all these things uh, which we have already discussed, it is equally important to write the point of the, uh, that is the, what we have already discussed is the surface modification in respect to the design. That is sharp edge or rectangular sloping edge, which is probably the cause as it has a mechanical pressure, the contact inhibition of the lens epithelial cell growth and the posterior capsular opacification is prevented. The edge glare being the most disadvantage, which we have already talked of. So as far as the postgraduates, even if it's an odd one to summarize these points, if you have already written, you I think you are done with that justice to that question. That's the... Uh, postgraduate point of view, clinical point of view, yes. Uh, I think we have already been discussed as far as the other parameters are concerned. Thank you, Dr. Mona. You are a classic teacher who wrote, jotted down the points and spoke very well. Yes, she, yes, yes. I was writing, sir's <laughs> incidents of PCO, CME, and of even, I, uh, I think uh, I was just a student when he was uh, giving his presentation. Yeah. So Actually, ma'am has uh, made entire uh, notes of uh, my PPT. Yeah. yeah <laughs> and the yeah, summary yeah. is there in our. Yeah. yeah. She is a classic teacher and still an avid teacher, though she has uh, moved out of medical college. She still continues teaching all the DNBT uh, so, uh, postgraduate institutes in our Nagpur city. She is most favorite and she is very loved for her so being so committed and so for her zeal for being so particular. Thank you, Dr. Mona, for beautifully summarizing the things. Do we have anything else, Dr. Sovira, Dr. Nivedita, ma'am, uh, where we can uh, can be of help beyond this surface modification? Because we have another 10-15 minutes. What other questions, uh, especially teachers like Dr. Nivedita, Mona, you must be aware about IELTS. What type of a questions they can ask you in the DNB? Toricity is something which is also can be added to this, like apart from the surface modification, the changes like the edge glare and all you spoke about square edge and all. So toricity is also done either in the anterior surface or in the posterior surface, depending upon which type of lenses. Sometimes when you have a dual surface modification requirement, like a multifocal lenses, so you keep the rings, the multifocal rings in one surface and the toricity in the other surface, anterior, posterior is split between the two. So these are the different things that they should uh, know. And uh, also the latest uh, lenses where EDOF lenses also will have different formats of, you know, the central uh, zones, which will have uh, specific uh, curvature changes. 
uh, that I think uh, was already touched upon, but uh, they should learn that also in detail about one or two examples where, you know, how they are differently modifying the central to extend and collapse the rays which are going to be in uh, focused on the retina to produce that extended depth of vision. So as we speak, I'm sure there are so many other modifications are being done. So which we will also be learning in the coming years. Dr. Suvira. Yeah, you're muted, ma'am. I think um, I think it could also, Toricity definitely, as ma'am is saying. But I don't know, I'm not sure because I'm not a postgraduate teacher exactly. I'm not sure though whether they would also need to know the the what what uh, about the surface mod the, the way the surface is modified the way the multifocal lenses are made how how they've got uh, uh, you know they've got a kiniform which is attached to a base monofocal lens and there are ridges and the heights and the width of the ridges define the near ad i don't know whether they expected to know that or no probably not i think that will be a large stretch yeah, yeah. Yes. 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 most yes. of the times these are kept in the viva uh, Correct. with the optics and instruments Correct. where intraocular lenses different types of intraocular mm -hmm. lenses are kept the scleral fixated or the iris claws or the multifocals and the even the Correct. trifocals uh, yeah. there they need to know something about the basic yes. principles here yes so it's very important here to know at least the principle behind the design of these multifocals or the torics there definitely yeah, and, and it's not that hard it's not that hard yes, yes. Yeah. they should know that yeah. i think this is such a topic unless you specifically look for it and prepare it you know, is very difficult to concord ad hoc. So I think I should really applaud for bringing up this and, uh, you know, elaborating and uh, putting it in a nutshell. So any postgraduate should look into this to get a good idea to prepare for the exam. I think it's a very nice attempt. Uh, I should appreciate the commitment of uh, AIS, ARC chairman, nice. along the, with the leadership of President uh, Dr. Harban Shlal, sir, where the feedback from the postgraduates are taken that what were the difficulties they have faced during the theory and the practical examination. The moment they come from the exam, we have a discussion, we jot down the points so that the other students will, who will be appearing the next year will be benefited and the theory paper as well as the practical part is discussed. So it's one-to-one -one discussion and I think Prashant, Dr. Prashant has... Uh, picked up those points and he has seen that justice is done to each and every postgraduate students all over the India because uh, not only in Maharashtra, it may be north, south, east, west, wherever they are. So DNB exams are definitely very tough and uh, they are not so, the environment is, uh, sorry to say, it's not so true friendly because the students are outside their state and always in a state where they need some moral uh, support or uh, security to from the examiners to just boost them up. That's a typical teacher speaking for us as a student and she is, that's why she's so deeply loved by the students in our region. Dr. Mona, thank you for bringing out this. Basically, my job as a AIS ARC chairman is basically to get all these things together there are many institutes who are helping us out in formulating these things. The credit, I shouldn't fish for the, rather I shouldn't take away the credit. There are institutes who are helping us out in framing this type of a questions. They give us the questions and uh, that's how we, uh, only thing is, my job is to put a, a hold of a guy called Dr. Kiran and put him in a, a corner and ask him to do a job like this and then people, teachers like you to compliment further whatever is missed out. So, in, in fact, my job is just a, a collaborator, getting people together on a single platform and getting some people to do hard work like Dr. Kiran did for us today. Thank you. And <laughs> even uh, thanks for giving me like a lot of time to prepare also, sir. Yeah. Uh, well, see, the, 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 the common misnomer when we go to correct uh, DNP theory papers regarding this question, which I've seen in previously also, they always go for like IOL designs, like whatever Mama has told. They discuss only about this multifocal diffractive, refractive pattern, and they think that is only surface modification. 
So this is just a part of like elaborated topic. So that's why I wanted to like start from A to Z and give as much as we can. I, I think they can, I think it's a 20 marker for them, 10 marker. Uh, so they can get at least uh, plus five <laughs> just by listening to this PPT or just by writing a summary of Mona Mams, no, that's enough. If they write that, they'll get uh, five plus marks. Thank you. I think uh, we had a good discussion today. So postgraduates, we are really, I hope this particular discussion as well as the presentation by Dr. Kiran Kumar must have uh, solved your uh, query. And in fact, Dr. Kiran has done a wonderful job of collating the whole subject and bringing it for you as a single capsule, which you can just uh, swallow it with a cup, cup of tea or a coffee wherever you are seated at this point of time. So thank you, Dr. Kiran for wonderfully doing this job for us. I know I had put you in a uh, corner <laughs> when one I... Minute, you, I... Dr. Prashant, one minute. I would like to interfere Please. here. The small diagrams which he had drawn by the pen, that is a thing which the postgraduate should have picked up. And those diagrams, if they have drawn to see how the square edge, how the edge, uh, it uh, uh, prevents the LECs and prevents the PCO. Even those small diagrams, if they draw, na, they, they we can pick up that this is a student who knows something about the yes. mechanism, what they... So those uh, small diagrams are very important to just... Even looking at those, we may not read what they have written and they'll definitely get the mark. Yeah. The schematics which we have, Dr. Kiran has, yes, postgraduates, you should remember... In fact, this link will be available on our ARC, ARC website throughout any time you can, uh, I mean, see, even if you tend to forget the thing, you can go back and again retrieve this particular uh, link and go back through the presentation and you would be through a thorough with it. So now it's time for us to say bye-bye to everyone. Thank you, Dr. Kiran. Basically, biggest thank to you for bringing out this <laughs> wonderful, difficult uh -huh. topic. Thank you. Well. So, Thanks yeah. a lot for the opportunity, sir. No, it's not an opportunity. It's a, I know I put you into, really, I had to, you had to do a lot of work for me. And in fact, my sincere most thanks to all the discussant, Dr. Suvira, Dr. Nivedita, and of course, my dear friend, Dr. Mona Deshmukh, who wonderfully complimented and made this session so interesting and uh, informative as well as educative for our postgraduates. So once more, my sincere thanks to all four of you from my young Turks and postgraduates whom AIS ARC is trying to help them out and frame some good questions and good postgraduate program. Thank we you. will be expecting your further uh, participation in future as well, all the faculties today. We would be needing your help to uh, bring out and make our students' life in future as easy as you could make out today. So it's time for us. Now, to come back to the thing, I need to thank on behalf of AIOS ARC. This is a small virtual felicitation of Dr. Kiran Kumar. This is a small certificate of uh, participation. Thank you, Dr. Kiran Kumar. Then Dr. Mona. Sure. It's a matter of, it's a gratitude to, gratitude to Dr. Mona, Dr. Nivedita and Dr. Sovira, you, I would be sending this on your mails. You can download it. Uh, definitely, this is the, just a token of our appreciation for all the efforts you have done for us. Thank you once more. Thank so you. it's thank you so for much. Us. Nice Thanks meeting. Thank nice you. Thank you, Sovira, ma'am.